tackling tough topics to help you think reasonably about life's most important issues. This is Thinker Sensitive. Welcome to the Thinker Sensitive Podcast. This is Chad Graham, and today I'm here with my co-host Ben Crenshaw to break down three different types of law. Law theory can make you dizzy, it's confusing at times, but we're here to break it down into bite-sized chunks just for you. Ben, thanks for being on the show today. Thanks for having me, Chad. All right, Ben, give us a quick overview of the three types of law. In a previous episode, we talked about natural law and defined it, but it's best in order to understand natural law to put it in its place with other law. Okay. So the two other kinds of law are divine law, which comes before natural law. Then you have natural law, and then after natural law, you have what's called human law or sometimes positive law. Okay. So these are the three kinds of law, divine law, natural law, and human law. And human law and natural law are subsets of the divine law, right? Yeah. So all of natural law is a subset of divine law. Um, those aren't this, they're not identical, and we'll explain the difference, but all of natural law is a subset of divine law. Now, certain aspects of human law are subsets of natural law, but there are components of human law or positive law that don't follow in accordance with the natural law. See, I'm already dizzy. <laughs> let's, let's dive into divine law, okay? Um, even if you don't believe in the divine, there's no denying that divine law has made a significant impact on how we understand and use law today. You know, we see tribute to the Ten Commandments in certain courtrooms today in the country. Walk us through divine law. What is that? The basics of divine law is that it's the ideas in the mind of God. Okay. So we're talking about the divine mind and the ideas in the divine mind. God's mind and his creation. So he's a rational person. And everything that he created and the reason for which he created it, the purpose for which he created it, and God's governance of his creation toward its ends, the divine purpose as well. So divine law uh, is eternal law, and it's based upon God's nature, not man's nature, God's nature. And it's exhaustively knowable only by God. We can only access a part of the divine mind and the ideas in the divine mind, but we can't, humans can't know it exhaustively. Right, what he chooses to share. Exactly. Right. Okay. Um, And so natural law, how is this different from divine law, and where do we see it in operation today? So natural law, as I said earlier, is a subset of divine law. So it relates to human beings and God's creation of human beings. So it's critical to grasp that whereas the uh, divine law is based upon God's nature, natural law is based upon human nature. Okay. And it's knowable by all humans, and it serves as an objective and universal standard. And then because of that... It has what we would call normative value, so it's binding. So the natural law is a subset of divine law. It's based upon human nature and the purpose for which we exist. And because of that, it tells us, as a law, how we ought to act. Okay. So because God created um, anything at all, all that he's created has purpose, has a, an end, And in that purpose, that creates then the human or the natural law, right? Exactly, yes. Okay, because humans have a a particular purpose for which they were created, then, you know, that gives rise to this natural law. Right, And, right? and the idea here is that because we're rational, we can look at ourselves through our own experiences and observation of human history, and we can discern through our reason what our purpose is. Okay, And then there's the third type of law, which is human law or positive law. Um, What is positive law and why do we call it positive law? Yes, we call it positive because it's created, in one sense, it's created by humans. Now, if a type of positive law is a subset of natural law, and what happens here is something like we might see in the U.S. Constitution and the Bill of Rights, this idea that we're going to write in a legal way, in a constitution, but we're going to we're going to write down human rights that are divinely created, 
and we find in nature. So it's so positive in the sense that we're putting it in a legal document and then we're going to enforce it in our society and it's going to form the basis of how we live together. So that's the idea. So some positive law, legislation and so forth, is based upon natural law, our discovery and discernment of how God has ordered the universe to function. And because all of natural law is a subset of divine law, then those positive laws that draw upon natural law also draw upon divine law. Yeah. Now, that's not the same thing as a theocracy because you're not starting with revelation yeah. and saying, well, God said, therefore, we're going to make it a law. You start from the bottom and by discerning the natural law, which is a part of the, the divine law, then you can create human law, which reflects that. Now, there might be some circumstances in which it differs for different cultures and so forth and so on. The other issue is that there are certain human law, positive law, that's conventional. So we come up with these rules because we just have an idea that this is how it's best to govern ourselves. So we'll talk about something like the classic example is what side of the road do you drive on? Yeah. This isn't part of natural law. It's not like if you move to the UK Always and, the you're, right yeah, side. and you're driving on the left side of the, raw law, uh, the road, then you're somehow violating the natural law and therefore you're violating divine law. No, it, this is custom. Yeah. It, you could create a society from scratch and decide that you're going to have three lanes and people from the age of you know, 18 to 30 are going to drive in the right lane, the, you know, so yeah. forth. You, you could make up something totally different. Yeah. There's nothing right or wrong about that. Without necessarily violating or even paying any tribute to natural law. Right. Now, if you, if you drive on the left-hand side of the road when you're supposed to be driving on the right-hand side of the road, you have done something wrong. Yeah. But you've done something wrong not because you've violated the natural law or the divine law, but because God has instituted governments over us for our good. And if everybody agrees that this law is for our good, even if it's a conventional law, then you endanger others and endanger the public good when you break it. Okay. So we have divine law, we have natural law, and we have human law or positive law. How does natural law correspond to the other two? Or, you know, how do, we, how do we understand natural law in light of the other two? This is a great question because um, you may not be a theist. You may deny the existence of God, and so you don't believe in divine law. And you even have a lot of people who will say, well, I don't believe that humans have an essence. So they're known as anti-essentialists. They don't believe that humans kind of have a set nature or something like that. So they would deny such a thing as natural law because natural law revolves around discerning and understanding human nature, the nature of of human beings and and the reality there. Now, we we talked earlier about uh, after the Enlightenment project, we bumped into the problem of moral relativism and social constructivism. So if you believe in that humans are nothing but evolved creatures and we might evolve further down the road, then we might evolve to have a different essence. Or if all of society is sociologically constructed, then we can make up our own being. We can be whatever we want to be. Right. We don't have a fixed purpose or end. Right. There's no fixed nature here. And this is where you get some, some of the movement in transgenderism or redefinition of marriage that these, something like marriage or the human person doesn't have an, a, an essence that's fixed or that's binding on humans, we can construct it to be whatever we want it to be. Right. So it's, it's important to understand that there are anti-essentialists out there who would deny that there's natural law. So what, what, what can we say in response to these people? I think we can say a couple things. First of all, we have to understand, if you go back to Aristotle and you talk about how he observed the world— the way it works is that we understand naturally, which is me, you know, you're yeah. trying to define a word with its own word, but that, that things are grouped together in the world by shared characteristics. So we can talk about dogness. Yeah. But we, what makes a dog? What makes a, a dog, dog a dog? So in yeah. essence, it's just that which makes something what it is. Now, we understand that a poodle is a dog and a German shepherd is a dog and a Labrador is a dog. And a greyhound is a dog. But we also know that they're all different kinds of dogs. But no one would confuse a greyhound with a house cat. Right. Or anything else. Or an elephant. Or an elephant. Exactly. Or a butterfly. 
So we, we understand that there are kind of tokens of things, kinds of things, but they're within those kinds, there's types right. of those t- kinds. So when we talk about an essence, we understand that, you know, when you, when you see a human, whether they're tall or short, whether they're black or white or brown, their ethnicity, their language they speak, their eye color, their hair color, you, you still understand, well, that's a human being. Yeah. So when you say, well, that's a human being, you recognize them as a human, you're basically admitting that they have an essence. Right. Because no one confuses a human being. Because they're not anything other than what they are, which is a human. Right. Yeah. Right. So I think from our, our natural way of observing the world and functioning is we admit to essences all the time. Now, we can talk about an essence, but in order to understand what a thing is, you really need to understand why it is or how, what it exists for. So we're, here we're talking about its purpose or its end. So if we think about the essence of, say, a car... Well, the essence of a car is to move you from point A to point B in a safe and comfortable way. Yes. But you only know what it is because you know what it is for. So the end or the purpose of the thing tells you what it is. If you say, I'm, I'm going to use my car, I'm going to go fishing today. <laughs> You're like, what? Yeah. That doesn't make any sense. Or, you know, I'm going to use my nose to eat my sandwich for lunch. Yeah. No, that's not what the nose is for. So if you define a thing, what a thing is by understanding what it's for. And because when you put those together, the being of the thing itself and what it's used for, you come up with the idea that to do good is to use the thing for what it's for. Yes. And to do wrong or evil, to misuse a thing, is to, is to use it for something that it's not for. Yes. So the idea of right and wrong, of goodness or evil, is extracted from our understanding of what a thing is and what it is for. And so when we're talking about natural law, we're talking about what a thing is and what it's for. And then the law component is the extraction of the goodness, how we are to use that thing according to what it is and what it's for. And that's where we get the natural component and the law component. Very good. Well, that's about all the time that we have for today. On our next episode, we'll offer a biblical case for natural law. Be sure to check out our content at thinkersensitive.com, where we host content on theology, philosophy, politics, and more. This is Chad Graham with Ben Crenshaw. We'll see you again next time on the Thinker Sensitive Podcast. For more Thinker Sensitive content, visit thinkersensitive.com. 